Hello, my name is Marvi Maiman. I want to talk to you about the video frame for this new chit chat of ours. What are the big issues we're trying to get fresh or meaningful, actionable ideas on? Does it even really matter in this new normal to have a visual frame? I believe it does. I want to use a few frames in the first episodes of this new chit chat. Frames that make us realize that what we are truly up against when trying to address issues for vulnerable. In essence, what are we trying to provide solutions for? Frames that make us go beyond our comfort zones. Frames which revolve around why conflicts, climate change, migrations, poverty reduction, SDG targets are baffling us despite all our multilateral arrangements. The first frame and inspiration for this video, video rencontre I wish to take is for emotional reasons from my first alma mater, the London School of Economics. My take on what affected me personally from Ms. Manoush Shafiq, the LSE director's book, namely, what we owe each other in the new social contract. Anyone who has been a student of religion, philosophy, politics, or international relations has a blurred, if not a clear idea of the original social contract as described by religions and Western philosophers of the likes of Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Hobbes, etc. However, what hit me in this particular book was the emphasis on what we owe each other in terms of a new social contract from cradle to grave in the 21st century. I have spent years buying, um, indulging and burying myself in books which introduce us to concepts about how the world will look like in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or even the next 100 years. I used to wonder why the obsession with the future outlook of the planet. The answer was obvious. I as leader and politician had to be prepared for what was coming. It wasn't about the bottom line for the next end of year sales figures, but what leading responsibly and setting into motion policies which would pay dividends for decades and generations. The trouble about being a politician was that an, in, in, that an election cycle never ends. It is, in the, it is cyclical. Planning is being done for the next elections and results are being demanded in the now and not in the next 30 years. Thus, as witnessed from many cabinet meetings, policy decisions got compromised into producing for now and not perhaps for longer. The good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that there are certain nations and countries who don't fall in the short-term trap for the now ratings or the now votes, but even they suffer the short-term hiccups. Despite this mad, insane political firefighting, I've spent many time sniffing, my time sniffing for trends for future generations. Ms. Shafiq's new book on the new social contract was only one such latest book which caught my eye. I have far too many such futuristic books in my personal library. This one is a new social contract for business, civil society, politicians, states, international community alike. I like the idea that is emphasized throughout the book that we live in shared commons, shared communities, shared society, where even if we wish to divorce ourselves and live like hermits, we truly cannot. It is all about leading national civilized lives with secure livelihoods where the chaos and noise factor can be minimized into rights and responsibilities. In my line of work, there is plenty of talk of what a modern welfare state ought to look like. My personal social protection ministerial experience aside, the religious compasses also point in that direction. However, what is obvious and what should be clear is what Ms. Shafiq points us towards. You need to put into the system as much as you can take out for the general common shared good. When that fails, other players, other than the state, of course, need to bridge the gap. And I'm not talking about the larger state or the multinational, multilateral community chasing sustainable development goals only. I'm personally more interested in the alignment of goals of the corporate side, the corporate social responsibility factor, bridging the state multilateral gap, as I call it. That is the framing I wish to clock with you today with our video rencontre. What needs to be understood perhaps prior to this is that the system is failing the majority. And that is clear cut when we look around ourselves. Perhaps this makes the marriage and complete alignment 
of the new social contract between corporate and the state and the multilateral organizations even more urgent today. The so-called collective solidarity does exist. But what I have witnessed from my time as Minister of Social Protection is the lack of alignment, the duplication, the wastage between affirmative action taken for enhancing brand value and meeting SDGs while serving the same vulnerable as two separate communities. So as Ms. Shafiq would call it, the circle of sympathy does exist from which stems moral needs. My point is that seamless alignment to cut her reinventing wheels and wastage has far from being perfected. The SDGs have given us a clear-cut agenda for fixing what needs to be fixed. But the insights of Ms. Shafiq are important. Let us start with the cradle and children as she does so. It is a well-known fact that investment or the lack of it in the first thousand days from conception fixes or breaks societies and nations. It is equally of no surprise to development economists and policymakers that family planning can lead to productivity gains with, with the women population partaking in the economic system. Avoiding women dropping out of the labor market is thus the key. The points that media and policymakers need to dig deeper on and expose to their audiences is that it is not a one size fit all. Societies, according to their own demographic fabric, will grapple with certain key policy decisions, namely what type of parental leaves, what type of quality and quantity of childcare centers, and how to resolve the age old question of informality of work. That is what they need to resolve in the final analysis to bring some sense into this madness. And that is where corporate social responsibility combined with state multilateral action can and should play its due role. And that is where the media and social media warriors need to zoom in on. Whilst I have seen malnutrition and stunting in my own country, I am fully cognizant of the advantages to children and a productive workforce of increasing the time women continue to breastfeed. Again, not novel concepts. We in Pakistan, when I was minister through the iconic social safety net of the Benazir Income Support Program from 2015 to 2018 launched conditional cash, cash transfers and women training on the same to reduce malnutrition. I'm glad the current government continues to expand on the same. However, certain balances need to be struck for the right productivity of each society. Developing countries like my own have experimented with conditional cash transfers for vaccination, nutrition, education, which safeguard rights of children and women alike. As minister, I launched them and saw the impact analysis, um, the advantages of the same on ground and in terms of statistics. The question I ask today is different. How aligned are philanthropic efforts to these state-led programs? And if they were aligned, how much of a force multiplier are they proving to be? We all know that from the age of two to three years, the quality of caregiving can make a nation's future productivity pro propel or nosedive. And yet, the question for policymakers and media is to check how many programs are aligned to optimize on that scientific fact. How many policymakers have invested with corporates in pre primary learning investments, when the statistics which lead these, lead these better indicators to a productive nation are crystal clear. Have we considered how many mother tongues and national language, languages children can absorb in order to be productive national global citizens without being caught up on the nationalistic protectionist archaic concepts on only one language? Ms. Shafiq brings some important insights into the future debate on education which will be part of the framing question. Firstly, how relevant is our adult and vocational training for jobs of the future? Are the future centers of excellence being constructed around the notion of relevant and survivable jobs of the future in a fast changing workplace? Are we sifting information through technology intelligently enough for the real educational needs of our future generation? Is it just good enough putting out of school children back into school, as perhaps my experience as minister showed me, when we did the same for 2 million children by 2017-18, and were naturally chuffed about our achievement? Or do we need to aim for relevance to future jobs the minute we design better programs for them? This leads us to workplace questions which have been raised by Ms. Shafi. 
what, which successful states have semi-mastered the link between education and livelihood? And here, my World Bank Partnership for Economic Inclusion, I'm proud to be associated with, is a good learning ground because it brings experiences from around the globe on successful economic inclusion programs of the same sort. Have we even identified state-wise details or have the social media warriors even questioned which change skills of the future will be required to keep our workplace nationally and internationally competitive and relevant? Has there been an analysis of worker return training programs so that they are useful and not redundant in the new social contract? Have pension plans and old age benefits been equitably designed? Has the concept of gender pay gap or the concept of overtaxing women when not taxed individually but as couples been raised? A fact which needs to be noted in finer point is that jobs will change and not get necessarily substituted, as Ms. Shafiq reminds us. Has there been enough consensus on how to bring the informal female workplace mainstream whilst improving GDPs and SDGs? Thus, as rightly pointed out by Ms. Shafiq, there should be no concept of vacant workforce, but a change for skills workforce. Automation does impact jobs, but does not necessarily create unemployment if done right. The combination of state and corporate social governance has to manage this shift as of yesterday so as to avoid the chaos and curse of future unemployment. On the health front, it is obvious that the world will continue to grapple with health worker shortages. But the good news is that health budgets due to pandemics, climate change, aging populations and conflict will increase too. The point is not the individual state response to universal equitable access to health coverage as per the means, but the levels of minimum guaranteed and cost sharing between identified new social contract stakeholders. Investing in shame, shaming unhealthy behaviors will need to continue being a part of the new social contract if health budgets have to be rationalized. And finally, the health technology advancements will have to work in leaps and bounds the biometric records for each patient, the mobile apps, the e-clinics, they will all need to be force multiplied through the new marriage of corporate and state. It goes without saying, and I'm on record as former Minister for Social Protection in Pakistan, saying many times that none of the above alignment is possible when systems are not merged and duplications are not cut out. Thus, a state's national socioeconomic registry or its household database has to be shared with data protection laws in place with the corporates. So they target as per their brand value, squeezing the maximum returns for themselves, their shareholders, and ultimately the joint vulnerable customers. Pakistan's first NSCR was made in 2010. As minister, I started its first updating in 2016 and launched it in March, 2018. And then the process for further updating, I assume, continued. This is what Pakistan got recognized for in 2010, and then in 2017, and then in 2018, and subsequently in 2020 by the international community. Household data is the gold factor in targeted vulnerable assistance. It determines poverty levels, and it determines who is deserving for which type of subsidy and targeted vulnerable assistance. It gives policymakers a clear cut idea of where to put the development dollars. Pakistan has exported this technology in my days to many other developed countries. And I hope the sharing of information will continue in current government days with other deserving countries through, through the data analytics we launched within the NSCR in 2017. And now ladies and gentlemen, an important concluding confession based on experience. The state cannot continue to function in isolation on its unconditional cash transfers, its conditional cash transfers, its universal basic income promises and subsidies without bringing in the corporates for a joint distribution of work, a joint deduped pooling of financial resources and expertise. This is the first frame I wish to draw in my video Rencontre with all of you. The how, while explained in my last book to be found on my website, marvimaymanllc.com, will be further explained in our future chit chats 